previous lab we, we were, or in the first part of this lab, we were really focusing on grain size and sort of looking at uh, the change in grain size uh, depending on uh, uh, a variety of factors, but mostly the environment of formation of these uh, uh, sedimentary rocks. Uh, and we were able to separate uh, gravely, gravely rocks, so rocks that contain gravel, from uh, rocks that are more sandstone dominated uh, and uh, these other sort of assemblages that are more uh, fine grained, so mostly siltstone and shales and mudstones more in general. So if we have to look at the composition of the rocks, uh, we can go back really here at the beginning of our classification based on grain size and we can investigate further the, the likely composition of these rocks. So for this exercise it is quite important uh, to have uh, basically something that can scratch the rock so that you can establish the hardness. Uh, so I can use this pen uh, to do that. So this is a steel file which will be useful to uh, differentiate between carbonates um, and uh, quartz, for example. And then we have also the acid, which has the same purpose. Um, the main goal here is really to detect uh, the difference between uh, carbonates and uh, other things. So let's keep these tools handy. So we, had, we have the hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is going to be useful to test uh, usually two things. Uh, so you can test uh, the clasts. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that we have rounded clasts in, in this uh, specimen and uh, also a matrix. Uh, so these two aspects really can be tested and, and uh, will give you insight on the composition of the rock. So we can do this test uh, as, a, as a starting point really in this uh, discussion about composition. And so if I could test, for example, this class here, and you can see that uh, there is no fizzing at all. So this rock then has other class with different colors. So it's important to test also the others. And you can see there is no real fizz in any of these class. So what this tells me is that uh, this rock has dominantly a terrigenal component uh, that is silsiclastic. Uh, and so most of this class uh, have a, a highly silicic composition. So essentially they're not carbonates. Uh, and because of that, uh, usually this will be a fairly mature sediment uh, or gravel in this case, which is uh, essentially composed of different cobbles here, uh, but it's very mature because of the high level of rounding and the fact that the composition is dominated by siliciclastic material. So that, I think, uh, is, is a critical uh, sort of aspect of the composition of this rock. What else could be in this rock uh, uh, besides quartz? I guess uh, there could be some clays. Uh, so some of the uh, weathering of uh, feldspar quite commonly results in the production of clays. So some of the matrix here could be represented by clays. Okay, so we have to test it with a steel file and see if I have soft material that can be easily scratched. And if you see, I can actually scratch quite easily some of the margins of these clasts whereas other parts are more difficult to scratch. Uh, so definitely there is some soft uh, uh, material in here. Uh, and so this could be a combination of things, but this glass is particularly soft, actually. I can see that. So I could test it also with, with acid, and I can see it's not fizzing. So I would, I would uh, definitely recognize here at least uh, a small percentage uh, in the cement uh, that is gluing together this class. Uh, 
uh, that is represented by clays essentially. So the composition here is uh, uh, a set of glass uh, that are dominated by silica rich glass or quartz like this example here and uh, then we have uh, that the matrix uh, is represented dom dominantly by again a silica cement uh, together with uh, 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 some clays uh, and that would be sort of enough in terms of composition for this particular uh, rock uh, what about this other uh, specimen? I bet it will be very similar uh, because this is very hard to scratch uh, and so most of this glass appear to be again siliciclastic. Uh, we can try with the acid to see whether there is any carbonate and you can see it doesn't really fizz that much. No fizzing at all. So very similar composition if compared to this other rock we just uh, examined. Uh, in this case, I can't see the angularity. So this is a less mature um, assemblage if compared to the other. And uh, the fact that it's less mature is also um, recognized by the fact that the cluster dimension it's really variable in this uh, specimen and the amount uh, of cement uh, is also more limited because all the clasts uh, in this specimen are touching themselves uh, and so it's a more compact uh, structure uh, where, where I would define it as a cluster supported structure for this aggregate. So what about this domain? Do we have some, some clays? Sometimes you can smell the specimen as well and uh, usually it has have, uh, a smell that is really typical of, of mud. Uh, so you can see I can scratch it quite easily in this part uh, and so it's certainly there is a component of mud in, uh, in this uh, matrix that is gluing together all the clasts. And also I can see some red spots here which indicates some some hematite alteration that has uh, partly altered probably existing feldspar or other ferromagnesium minerals um, so i think that's pretty much uh, about the composition of this rock so no fizzing quite often you think it's a siliciclastic uh, assemblage and it, this could have combination of quartz, so silica rich class uh, and uh, also um, muds or clays, um, um, so which are dominated by phyllosilicates again. So the kaolinite is a good example of clay. What about this assemblage here? I think we still have quite hard materials, but there could be some carbonate in this rock. Uh, see, this one is much softer. Let's test it. No feeds. So still we have a siliciclastic rock in, in this case, but we can see that the um, class are very much angular. They are also a matrix supported and we have that the matrix uh, is uh, dominated by a mixture really of uh, oxide rich materials or clays. Uh, so in this rock the matrix is more abundant uh, but it's still of siliciclastic composition so we have dominantly clays. Uh, um, there are other minerals in here that I can see. So this one looks like uh, it's still quite hard. So it's definitely not uh, a gypsum crystal. Um, so in this case, um, this could be quartz uh, as well. Uh, so that, that could be quartz. Uh, and yeah, I have class of variable dimension. I can see this one here. It's quite greenish 
in color and also doesn't fizz so mm, the coloration i would say is related to the different uh, level of alteration in this uh, um, rock that has again a, varia a variable amount of matrix and and class and the, but is dominantly i would say um, matrix supported uh, and fairly angular so remember to describe well uh, the class so when we have a discussion and, and sort of trying to ask questions about uh, the response to acid and also the hardness of of this class which looks like they are pretty much all around seven or more. Um, so that's another siliciclastic rock. What about this assemblage? Well, this uh, has uh, definitely a different um, sort of feel. We have much larger class and that are in this characteristic uh, brown to yellow color. They're definitely angular. And a major distinction, I think, in this specimen uh, is the fact that uh, you have uh, essentially a monomictic uh, assemblage. So the composition of this class uh, is pretty much equal. So they're all similar and they seem to be a pre-existing rock, uh, which, is, uh, which has been likely silicified. Why am I stating that? Because I can see that this, this sedimentary rock went through a significant amount of diagenesis and silicification, which I can recognize by the fact that I have irregular uh, boundaries that uh, are particularly rich in organic matter. And so I can see here quite convoluted boundaries uh, along this class. So for example, here it's quite evident uh, uh, that uh, these margin of this class is particularly enriched in organic ma matter because it's much darker and it does have these very convoluted edges. Uh, so that's quite often an indication of pressure solution that has taken place. Uh, so during diagenesis, usually a rock will undergo a significant amount of compaction and that compaction will result uh, in a pressure solution. So you have essentially that you dissolve part of, of the rock on, on the edges of the class and you redistribute it into the matrix. And this is quite, quite often happens in carbonate rocks. So we should test uh, here for uh, uh, the response in this case. And we can see that there is not much fees but if I, I put it in here, I can see some bubbles that develop. They are quite weak, uh, but that's a good indication that uh, uh, this was originally a carbonatic rock, which has been heavily silicified. So you have to test the cavities uh, that uh, you see, and this is also an important feature, which is uh, useful for di uh, diagnosing the uh, existence of uh, dolomite. Okay, so usually a carbonate during diagenesis can recrystallize into dolomite and often this reaction will tend to reduce the volume of uh, the rock and so the mineral dolomite will lose volume if compared to pre-existing calcite because again we have essentially a double carbonate we are adding magnesium into the structure and, and so we have a calcium double calcium magnesium carbonate forming and so you you do have you know that uh, the dolomite fizzes more hardly and in fact we had very little bubbles in here uh, but still if you test the cavities you can see some fizzing and so that's indicating that there is carbonate. Uh, it's of course a carbonate that is different from calcite so it will not react as heavily but again it's it's really a set of observation that you need co to consider uh, 
when you're dealing with with carbonates um, and also this pinkish color for the matrix uh, and the fact that the matrix is a microcrystalline matrix uh, so it's not really uh, composed of fragments uh, it's indicating a high level of replacement and silicification in this rock and uh, that's quite often happening uh, when when you have carbonates that are undergoing diagenesis so you often have a redistribution of silica in these rocks uh, so there is a lot of uh, dissolution that occurs uh, and that's manifested in this these continuous surfaces that we can recognize along the clasts. Why are these particularly dark? Quite often that happens because the uh, residue that is insoluble, which is dominantly carbon, will be, because this was a biogenic rock, uh, it will be accumulated along these pressure solution surfaces. And so as a consequence of that, quite often uh, you tend to have an increase of organic matter where you tend to have uh, the formation of solution surfaces. These take uh, quite commonly the name of stylolites. So stylolites are actually found in limestone quite often, although you can find those also in silicyclastic rocks that are particularly rich in silica. But again, in this case, the uh, fizzing is suggesting that this was originally a carbonatic uh, rock. So in terms of composition, really, we are more in uh, an environment that uh, is, uh, you know, found, for example, in the neritic zone, so in a carbonatic platform environment. And because of that, the composition will be dominated by uh, carbonate again replaced by silica let's see this other specimen uh, this is quite unique because uh, it contains uh, a variety of fragments of uh, crinoids uh, which, is a, which is a particular type of fossil so crinoids um, usually have uh, an elongated stem so they look uh, like uh, plants uh, if you want uh, and uh, quite often the stem of these uh, um, sort of pseudo corals uh, will be preserved and uh, uh, it's essentially uh, breaking down often into discs so depending on the orientation they will appear either as uh, sort of corrugated uh, um, secta that are all connected uh, uh, and forming these stems or sometimes you find that uh, they have uh, uh, this uh, discoidal appearance because they've been broken down by uh, the high energy environment where uh, they accumulated uh, so often uh, when you deal with the sedimentary rock uh, in marine environments um, that uh, are in a carbonatic platform, usually you have um, and the, uh, yes, in the neritic environment, you tend to have a high energy related to the seawater that has significant uh, uh, wave action and, and currents uh, that tend to move around the sediment, so loose sediment will uh, tend to be reworked significantly and this will result in breaking down of biogenic material. So this biogenic material should be carbonatic uh, if uh, I am correct. Uh, so you have to see whether you have any fizzing. And I can, I think I can see some feeds. You can see very vivid, effervescent fizzing here on this specimen so definitely the skeleton of these organisms uh, is uh, uh, composed of calcite so the composition of of this rock will be dominated by calcite it's also quite smelly so ma many times you have combinations of clays uh, and uh, uh, and also uh, carbonates uh, so you could define rocks like these as uh, rocks that are partly composed of carbonate as well as 
clays. Uh, so how do you know that there is clay? Usually the, uh, the rock is quite soft, um, so you can scratch and remove the clays quite easily. And in fact, here I have plenty of, of clay dust. Um, and so this is definitely a rock that has a matrix uh, that has a high abundance of clays. Uh, and, and as a consequence of that, it's, it's uh, something that can form, for example, in mud flats um, in areas that uh, are sort of um, relatively shallow. Uh, in, for example, a marine laguna setting, you might find uh, uh, this type of uh, mud, um, mud rocks. Um, so the mud can have a variable composition, it can be clay or it can be uh, carbonatic. Um, in this case, if we test the mud with the acid, we see that it doesn't uh, fizz a lot, or actually it doesn't fizz at all. So there is some fizzing, but I think it's mostly linked uh, with the fossil content. So definitely there is quite a bit of clays uh, present in, in terms of composition of this rock. So I would state that the rock has quite a bit of carbonate, but also quite a bit of clay. So the same will be true for this other, uh, which looks more yellowish, and often you, you tend to have alteration of these rocks that will add uh, um, oxides, uh, so iron oxides can develop, or hydroxides, so you might have uh, um, things like hematite or limonite uh, forming, so you can test those and see whether these are, are really effervescent. Uh, and so in this case, it's, it's looking like these are iron carbonates because they're fizzing quite a bit. So, so this is quite soft, but not as soft as the other I was testing earlier. So this rock, I think, has uh, an accumulation really of a more carbonatic, uh, um, carbonatic or carbonate rich matrix, I would say. And uh, uh, yes, and there is also a mixture of uh, uh, cla biogenic class in this, uh, in this rock. So I can definitely recognize uh, these uh, uh, circular features, uh, which are the disks, uh, which are essentially part of, of the skeleton of the crinoids. So all these secta are disks. Uh, uh, that breaks down and, and form this characteristic uh, discoidal aspect. Uh, but also you can see here I have a much darker fragment. Uh, and so if I test it, I can see that it's also highly effervescent. Uh, and that's another good indication that this fragment uh, is also of biogenic origin. Uh, so rather than being a siliciclastic fragment, uh, it looks uh, as um, likely, it's looking like it's uh, a fragment of a shell. So bivalves uh, or brachiopods uh, quite often will appear as dark fragments like this. And uh, uh, sometimes you can recognize easily the shape of, of a shell. Um, so you can think of it, uh, you know, as um, something that was trapped in uh, a sandy uh, carbonatic sandstone and resulted um, in, uh, in this accumulation of biogenic uh, material, which is dominated by crinoids as well as, uh, you know, these shells. Why do I think it's a shell? Because here I can see like a three-dimensional image of this class, you can see here a very thin, dark boundary. And if I rotate the rock, I can see a curvilinear pattern, which is really resem resembling the shape of a shell fragment. So I think that's definitely in, uh, indicative of, of uh, a, a essentially one of the halves of a bivalve likely has been trapped in this sediment and then solidified through, through diagenesis. Uh, so definitely a mixture of class, so it's important uh, 
if we uh, sort of consider like a specimen like this that you recognize the existence of, of two different biogenic uh, materials, um, so shell fragments uh, versus crinoids. Um, and uh, for, the, for the majority, this rock will have a carbonatic, carbonate composition because of the fact that also the matrix uh, fizzes quite a bit. We have to test it really carefully. So test also this other part uh, and see if there is any fizzing. And I, I don't see fizzing on, on this particular part of the rock. Uh, so a little bit there. Here there is a match. So I think this rock contains also a smaller proportion if compared with the other specimen of uh, uh, clay material. Okay. So that would be really enough for the discussion of these fossil rich specimens. Here we have different fossil contact and this uh, is more typical of a fluvial setting. So many times uh, when you are in a meander uh, on a river system you tend to accumulate sanding material that contains uh, um, essentially vegetation. So you trap the vegetation uh, in the sediment uh, and um, that gets transformed into carbon so you, it turns all the organic matter turns into graphite because um, it's um, essentially a process in which uh, you have uh, that the oxidation state of the sediment uh, is uh, uh, you know mostly acidic uh, so you tend to have uh, uh, very low pH uh, and uh, conditions that are sort of favorable to um, EH that uh, tend to preserve organic matter. And as a consequence of that, uh, um, you tend to have situations in, in which you accumulate uh, quite a bit of, of organic uh, substance. In this case, you can recognize uh, uh, fragments uh, of uh, um, vegetation that uh, uh, are actually um, easy to spot because they're dark with respect to a lighter, in co lighter color matrix. Uh, so how do we uh, see that? Uh, if we take another specimen, we can see that I have elongated stems uh, in this rock. Uh, so this gives me the feeling that this was a part of a plant uh, and this could, be, could have been uh, a, a leaf uh, of a plant uh, and it's because it's very wide but very thin so it's concentrated only on, on this top surface. Uh, so it's, you can see that in section it's very thin and uh, it's likely uh, the result of uh, foss fossilizing essentially a uh, plant leaves. Um, um, here are other sort of better representations of the stems uh, of the plant preserved um, in this uh, specimen. And uh, yeah, it's very, very um, gritty. So it's, it's essentially mostly um, arenitic I would say and I can see in this specimen a well-defined stratification and also I can see a change uh, in, in grain size uh, which is also interesting um, so I would definitely describe this uh, as a stratified rock uh, and I would test the different levels to see if there is any change in composition and uh, yeah, I don't see much fizzing in this rock, uh, which is sort of in agreement with the environment of formation. So if you expect to form um, this rock uh, in, the, in a riverbed, quite often it has seen a significant amount of transport and you lose completely the carbonates. Uh, and so you tend to have a rock that is essentially dominated by, by a coarser fraction of, of clays. Um, so clays and sandy material will be uh, mostly the matrix of, of this rock, a combination of clays and sandy material. It doesn't look uh, as this rock is 
fairly well sorted. I can see small plugs, dark in color, and they're quite um, translucent, and I would say, yeah, reflective, more correctly. So they reflect significantly. Quite often, if you see these small dark plugs uh, and you magni magnify them, you will see those pseudo hexagonal basal bases and if you can scratch them super easily which is what i'm doing right now well in that that case that's biotite so there is also some biotite in in this uh, uh, specimen so definitely phyllosilicates are abundant in this rock uh, and this is a mo more of a siliciclastic rock really with of course an important fossiliferous content uh, which is organic uh, related ma matter matter that is uh, derived from vegetation that was trapped uh, in the sediment uh, we uh, continue with these other specimens here of course this has a completely different feeling in my hands uh, i can definitely recognize a high energy texture in this rock so it will be very hard to scratch i can't scratch it because the steel file is 7.5 but this rock is uh, dominated by quartz so it's also likely that this rock underwent significant amount of diagenesis and potentially some metamorphism and so although you can recognize the precursor composition so this was mostly a a quartz sandstone uh, and you can see you know these ripple marks uh, are a good indication of the environmental formation of this sand so sometimes well reworked sand beaches will end up uh, being extremely or 100 percent quartz uh, so super mature and uh, because of that uh, you tend to have that during metamorphism you recrystallize completely the quartz uh, and you get a much more compact uh, rock so i don't i don't sort of s see any well-defined uh, grain although i can feel some of the grains uh, so it's not as heavily metamorphosed many times metamorphism will change completely the structure of the rock uh, so you will lose also the preservation of, of uh, the ripple marks uh, okay so uh, of course we will talk, ab talk about uh, these structures uh, more in detail during the lectures uh, uh, if we haven't really addressed it uh, but we should have I think we should have already addressed this in in, in, in the uh, lecture um, so this is dominant records I'm not going to test it with the acid because I am really confident, but let's do a test, sorry. I have to do it and I can see that there is no fizzing at all. What about this sediment here? Okay, this one is very complex in terms of texture. I can definitely recognize at least two minerals. And this is because the grains here are quite large. So they, I think, even exceed the two millimeters for this uh, rock, although this is sort of a layer. So I would still think of this rock as a, as a sandy rock. And I can see definitely some stratification in here. So it's important, I think, to, to uh, test this rock with, with the acid again to see if there is any fizzing in different locations so remember to test different locations on your specimen um, or ask actually for tests on different locations if, if we are going to discuss the specimen together and uh, yeah i think uh, there is not much fizzing in this rock really and so i can see clearly optically i can recognize uh, uh, grains uh, that are quite glossy in appearance and so i would state that this could be either carbonate or quartz based on on this first sort of evaluation but the fact that there is no reaction to acid uh, 
it's suggesting that this is a siliciclastic rock, so there is quite a bit of quartz in this rock, uh, which is should be relatively hard. And in fact, it's quite quite difficult to scratch uh, the quartz grains. Uh, so I can remove them, but yeah, they don't not really scratching them that easily. I would say this one is quartz for sure. Um, so what's left? I think it's these other minerals in here, which are more reddish in color or pinkish. So I have also some uh, sections that are fairly elongated and uh, some others are more stubby. And so there is, certainly this is a prismatic mineral and I would have to look really at a magnification of the specimen to check if there is any cleavage. But I'm pretty sure there will be cleavage and um, I can see that is translucent and also re quite reflective uh, by the look of, of it. Um, so many crystals reflect quite a bit of light and some of the sections actually are fairly square so actually i can actually see some some cleavage here so my my first impression here would be that uh, these are crystals uh, uh, that are also more easily scratched uh, and uh, yeah because of these sort of description the pinkish color some of the prismatic aspect uh, the fact that is uh, you know having some cleavages, it's telling me that this is likely feldspar. So this would be likely K feldspar, so this rock is fairly immature because of the abundance of, uh, of K feldspar. So I would uh, state that at least 30 to 40 percent of this specimen has a composition that is feldspatic and then the remaining part is quartz and there could be also some clays of course especially in these levels and so there, there are some some small strata that uh, are probably more clay rich uh, they look more softer and so i can scratch them more easily so definitely a, a variable compositions depending on the stratigraphy you can see here a, a tiny little strata uh, that yeah but it's still still there could be quite a bit of quartz as well uh, but yeah in the end uh, in conclusion i think this rock is fairly immature because also the grains are quite large quite angular and it's definitely particularly rich in feldspar and so that's telling me quite a bit about the history of the rock um, if you take this other it looks very similar but the grain size is much finer and uh, yeah it's sort of difficult to see any any feldspar in here and i can see though some muscovite so there is quite a bit of a shine on on one of, of the uh, class so one of the class look uh, quite uh, uh, metallic and also quite uh, uh, rounded so this looks more uh, a mature mature sand because of the abundance of phyllosilicates um, so see here how all this surface is quite shiny so there is a abundant muscovite present in this specimen so all these darker spots that we see in this sandy rock well those look like they are uh, phyllosilicates uh, so it's very abundant the phyllosilicate component so phyllosilicates tend to be uh, well preserved uh, and so they they can be transported by significant distance so if you rework a sandstone you still have on sand beaches presence of biotite and also presence of uh, muscovite. So definitely this rock contain those. We would have to test if it's carbonatic or not uh, and see if there is any, you know, any major fizzing. And for these locations, definitely I don't see any fizzing. So this rock is dominated really by uh, 
the siliciclastic matrix uh, so it will be quartz and likely glaze uh, so you have to test you know, for the hardness uh, it looks quite quite soft and I don't see a lot of cement it's very porous uh, this sandstone so it's probably heavily altered uh, but yeah I would still classify it as a siliciclastic rock with the variable component of quartz uh, and uh, and mud but yeah it's or clays but very difficult to establish here the proportion but by looking at the amount of muscovite I would definitely have a good percentage of clays present in this rock uh, and other phyllosilicates such as the muscovite and probably there will be also some biotite but I could not really spot the biotite unless this grain is a biotite so I, I would have definitely to look uh, at the uh, um, sort of magnification would help uh, trying to identify the mineralogy a bit better there seems to be also a feldspar in here so maybe a remanence uh, of uh, so if we have to you know to distinguish in terms of maturity these rocks I would put this first as less mature so the first sort of sandstone that you form will be particularly rich in feldspar and then you go into a more intermediate uh, specimen that has phyllosilicates, some fragments of feldspar, very limited uh, and then you enter into these other sandstones that have sort of the majority of them will be siliciclastic material dominated by quartz uh, so that that would be sort of the progressive transport and uh, um, maturation of, of sand, sandy rocks. And then we have these other specimen here. You, you can see it's highly stratified. So we have uh, um, sort of very uh, fine strata in terms of thickness. Uh, so thin layers uh, repeated sequentially which is suggestive of an environment uh, the, that has a lot of changes or seasonal variations during sedimentation. So these could be, you know, lagoons quite often have this type of rhythmites, uh, so rocks that have a rhythmic uh, uh, variation in, in the sedimentation rate. Uh, so the, the, the different colors quite often reflect uh, the abundance of organic matter that gets deposited uh, and so in a mad flat, uh, quite often you, you will end up having different colors in response to the organic supply uh, in these uh, uh, sort of ephemeral basins. Uh, uh, quite often the mud is microcrystalline and carbonatic in composition. And so you will see sometimes that it fizzes. Some others it doesn't uh, because the majority of the sediment is coming from a river system. So it's essentially sediment that spills out or spills over uh, into a, a lagoonal setting and it's deposited uh, in these more uh, quiet environments and so all the fine fractions get accumulated and so this is still quite gritty but it's more silty in, uh, rather than sandy material and so that's kind of a transition between uh, uh, because the rock starts to become quite smooth uh, and so because of that I, I would definitely think of these as more a silty silty rock and uh, yeah it's not really fizzing so for me the composition in this case is still a combination of quartz and, and, and silica so not a lot to see because again we are entering rocks that are much finer grain size. The other example is this here. This is quite smelly, so a lot of lots of mud is present in in this uh, specimen. Uh, in this case, we can see an interesting feature. So if I look at the stratification in the rock, uh, I can definitely see some sort of planes of or discontinuities which represent the stratification of this specimen but at the same time I can see more um, angular um, beds uh, so these are cross beds uh, 
So that's a good indication that this rock uh, has formed in a more high energy environment in which you have progressive movement of currents uh, that will influence uh, the orientation of, of uh, these uh, beds uh, while they are depositing. Uh, and so cross beds uh, we'll see in the lecture if we haven't done it already are, are actually a good indication of the um, fluvial settings uh, or lagunal settings when, when you have sort of um, um, progressive tidal variations that will influence uh, the depositional uh, processes. Um, so you can see here some of these beds uh, coming and abutting this more flat plane or layer. Uh, so that is actually a good indication of, of a truncation on, on the uh, sedimentary sets that I can recognize. Uh, and so uh, that's a good indication again of cross bedding for this specimen. We should check uh, the composition and see if uh, um, it's partly enriched in carbonate. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is still uh, likely a fluvial, fluvial environment because I don't get any any fizzing on this rock, so I dominated by mud in this case. I would say because of this the smell and uh, um, the fact that it doesn't fizz and the cross bedding is telling a lot about uh, uh, this uh, assemblage is quite uh, smooth, so very uh, silty in this case, uh, and so more clay rich. Uh, so remember, when you move into rocks that are much finer grain size, the proportion of clay will increase dramatically, and so clays and phyllosilicate would be much more dominant if compared to quartz. Uh, so a rock like this, uh, I again, it's more a, a silty rock, and the composition will be clay dominated. And then we move to these other specimens here. These are quite heavy, and this is a good, good uh, information to to sort of get, uh, there is a lot of quartz in this rock. So I can see, I hardly can scratch it. Uh, so it's very hard. Uh, so the seven is working. So definitely this could be also a quartz vein actually that is present in this particular specimen. But definitely we can see uh, that the rock when it breaks, uh, it's very sharp, so has sharp edges and so this feature, if you remember, it's very similar to obsidian or rocks that are really glassy. And this is a good indication that you're dealing with a rock that is highly silicified. So it's more like a chart, if you want. And uh, that's a good sort of way of classifying the rock just based on the amount of silica. So there will be quite a bit of silica in this rock. So quartz is a dominant component. Uh, but there will be also clays, uh, uh, which are this reddish fine grain material. And also we can see very speckly layers. So this rock is heavily stratified. You can see that quite easily. And the stratification colors are sort of going from reddish, deep red into more uh, gray. Uh, and also the uh, reflectivity of the rock changes dramatically. These red layers are more dull uh, and uh, potentially glassy a little bit. They reflect some light. Um, and that's, I think, the result of silicification. Um, but at the same time, you see also that these are very metallic uh, or submetallic. Uh, so see here how they're speckly. So speckles like these uh, quite often could be either uh, oxides, uh, or uh, uh, phyllosilicates. Uh, so you have to sort of look for, for things uh, that can help you with this uh, distinction. One is the hardness. And in fact, if I scratch this, it feels quite hard and not easy to scratch. So I would, you know, interpret this definitely as abundant oxides. Uh, and in this particular case, these are iron oxides, uh, which is also suggested by the red color. Uh, 
of some of the charity material. Um, so these rocks are commonly very rich in iron and this is why they are really heavy. So you will have combinations of magnetite uh, and hematite in these rocks uh, uh, in some of the layers. So, so you'll see how this is really magnetic. So another important test, it's really to test if, uh, if the rock is magnetic and in this case it is. So these are magnetite layers. Uh, so probably a combination of magnetite really and hematite and, and these are good examples I think of iron ores so they are also called banded iron formations because of the bands and, and the fact that you have these levels that are particularly enriched in, in iron so remember if you see a rock, a rock that is really dark red and has stripes that has metallic appearance or submetallic appearance it should uh, straight away trigger you towards uh, um, these uh, really iron rich assemblages. Some examples are the Western Australia big mines of, of the Pilbara district uh, that contains really huge amounts uh, of iron which is commonly mined and shipped off to China. So for construction purpose of course. So steel production relies on, on these rocks uh, and uh, uh, yes, the iron ore that is in here is in high percentage. Uh, sometimes it can exceed the 70% uh, for this particular rock type. Um, example of this can be found, for example, in, in the Hammersley Basin, again in, in the Pilbara district uh, in Western Australia. So remember, these are stratified rocks. Uh, and they have a composition that is dominated by silica and iron oxides. Okay, we have now this specimen, which is very fine grain. Really, we're, we're going really down. You can see the mites here, which is suggestive of a, a lagoonal setting or a, a ephemeral lake setting, or in this particular case, a sabka environment. Uh, why am I saying this? Because this looks like salt to me and um, I would definitely test straight away for hardness and in this case it's very soft. So that's really an hardness uh, that uh, is you know down uh, to the two. In fact I almost yes I'm able actually to scratch it with my fingernail so I can scratch it with the fingernail. So that's already helping me with the composition of this rock because I can say, okay, I think that this rock is either anhydrite or gypsum. And because of the translucency of the rock, I've, I would argue that this rock doesn't have a lot of water. So it's more likely an anhydrite. And also I can see some dark layers which likely will have a variable composition so there could be a combination of clays carbonates um, so these evaporites uh, quite often form with combinations of gypsum and uh, carbonate how do you tell if it's a combination you would have to test it with the acid so the gypsum will not fizz so in this part of the rock uh, there is no fizzing Instead, if I test a portion that is more dark, I can see effervescence, vivid effervescence. So this rock contains mostly anhydrite, so calcium sulfate, but also calcite. So a combination of, of these two minerals dominantly. And there could be also sun clays because of the darker colors. So clays, carbon will be uh, present uh, because you have paucity because of the cyclicity uh, that is uh, sort of common. So usually salts will be developed uh, seasonally in response to high evaporation rates. Uh, so when the evaporation rate is very low, you tend to form more clay 
and carbonatic uh, material because you drop essentially the precipitation of, of gypsum and, and, and anhydrite. So it's, it's common to have these cycles in uh, Sabka lakes uh, and this will be manifested in textures of this type, so fairly well stratified textures uh, which indicates that there is, there is definitely cyclicity in the sedimentation processes and uh, this has influenced the variable composition of, of this specimen. So that's important. Remember to test for hardness. So if you can scratch a rock with your fingernail, probably it's an evaporite. This other specimen uh, is rather different. Uh, you can see the conchoidal fracturing. It's very smooth. So we are moving from, from rocks that uh, you know, are uh, still a bit gritty to very smooth rocks. Uh, and that's a good indication that you are you know, in, uh, at the limit between mud, mud rocks like mudstones, siltstones, and shales. And I think this could be classified as uh, a, likely a shale because of the uh, fissile nature of, of these rocks. I, I can see definitely very, very thin, thin layers uh, in, in, this, uh, in this specimen. So the stratification can be helpful as a diagnosis uh, to identify a shale versus a, a more sort of less fissile uh, rocks so or using mudstones will be less fissile. Um, I would test for, for composition then with the acid uh, and it should not fizz at all. In fact, it doesn't because this is a mud rock so it's dominated by siliciclastic material uh, that uh, uh, can have in this case a variable uh, sourcing. So there could be some terrigenal components in this rock, uh, but uh, many times uh, this, uh, this rock forms in, in abyssal plains. Uh, and so their composition is essentially controlled by microorganisms that die in the seawater and precipitate on this uh, distal part of, of um, um, I would say, a basin. So abyssal plains are quite away from the shore and uh, because of that, uh, you know, you get very fine grain material deposited. Uh, so composition will be dominated by silica rich organisms, uh, so the skeletons of organisms. Uh, and these are commonly foraminifera or they can be also uh, um, alga, so algal microalgal matter, so di diatomeas uh, will have co composition that is silicic uh, and radiolarites uh, are commonly uh, represented or dominated by radiolaria. And so these are fossils, microfossils that uh, will uh, constitute the uh, matrix of this rock. Um, so difficult to recognize minerals in these specimens, uh, but I can see a small fragment here, so uh, this could be carbonate uh, or could be something else. So it doesn't really fizz that much, uh, so it could be just uh, uh, a, a, a fragment or a clust uh, that has been trapped uh, in, in this uh, um, sediment. So some clasts will be trapped and they have more you know, silica rich composition still, so it's still quartz, uh, but they are coarser because uh, they come from the shore, so they are essentially transported through particular types of currents, uh, which, which are turbidity currents. Uh, so we will we'll see that more in detail when, when we deal with the lecture, but yeah, remember in terms of composition, this rock uh, is really dominated by uh, silica. I think it's the same for this one. See, you, it's uh, more stratified though. So we have uh, a better defined stratification on the rock uh, and it might be actually quite soft, which is an indication that this rock is actually different from, from, from this one.
uh, in terms of composition looks quite soft so it doesn't fizz that much yeah probably I would say that this rock has more of a terrigenous component is dominated by by clays uh, and because of that uh, you don't have the same level of silicification so definitely this is this is more of, of a lagoonal setting for this specimen and uh, although there is not much carbonate so I would argue that this rock is more uh, similar to these others here so it does have a, a, a good component of clays in it uh, and that's why you can scratch it easily uh, so is it uh, an evaporite I don't think it's the case because I can hardly scratch it really see I cannot really scratch the rock with my fingernail so I don't think this rock has a lot of gypsum or anhydrite in it uh, um, it's more a combination of uh, um, clay material and organic matter and in fact you can see the change in in coloring is quite abrupt um, so we have layers that contain very little organic matter and others that are dominated by organic matter so this is still a silt to shale rock but uh, because of the grain size but the composition is different I think um, so I would place it here. Um, this specimen instead uh, yeah, feels very hard. I can scratch it, but it's much, much harder than that one for sure. Uh, so the feeling is that this rock has quite a bit of silica in it. It's very fine grain, really dark, suggesting the there is a lot of organic matter so quite often sedimentary rocks that form in abyssal settings uh, they will tend to um, have situations in which uh, there is not much supply of sediment uh, and so a lot of the terrigenous supply will be uh, organisms uh, that die and, and precipitate on, on uh, maximum floating surfaces which are uh, essentially low depositional lows uh, and so quite often these will have really a huge amount of organic matter and this is a good example of that so definitely that that could be you know things like bituminous shells uh, they will have lots of organic matter and in fact uh, they are also uh, termed as source rocks uh, for hydrocarbon reservoirs uh, so a rock like this might liberate through diagenesis um, hydrocarbon which then get transported and trapped in uh, optimal sites uh, uh, for example the crests of anticlines um, okay so this is uh, a silicic rock uh, again similar story than than this one that is more reddish uh, this is a good comparison i mean um, there is a surface uh, um, that is you know parallel to sea floor which represents the uh, compensation boundary essentially with uh, with respect to the precipitation of uh, carbonates and also the oxidation state of the water so usually in abyssal plains um, really deep uh, you get reducing conditions which will tend to preserve the organic matter and so you get the darker specimens uh, like this uh, instead if you are in a situation in which there is oxidizing influx uh, from uh, uh, the shore you tend to have oxidation of the organic matter and you get more reddish uh, sediment uh, a bit like the oxidation we see for the beefs uh, which are again speculated to be linked uh, with the big oxidation era same story here you can see uh, this rock is heavily laminated which is a good indication that we are dealing with uh, a shale it's very fine grain very smooth uh, it's non-carbonatic I, I would speculate that this doesn't fizz uh, 
and in fact it doesn't so no fizzing at all and uh, yeah very fine grain see this side has been polished uh, and uh, we can see again the stratification I actually prefer this side it's much more evident the stratification of this rock uh, I don't see really any minerals uh, it's too fine grain too smooth uh, and so definitely a shale because of this uh, fissile nature and uh, the fact that it is highly siliciclastic uh, so I would go and put it with these other specimens here okay we are left with these so remember the importance of, of distinguishing sort of microcrystalline rock uh, with respect to, to their composition so in this case I don't see any clear stratification but I see pressure solution surfaces so you can see uh, the thing I was discussing before with this specimen so this one here I was t telling you before that uh, there are convoluted boundaries forming and you have here a good example of those convoluted boundaries uh, so these are much bigger so you can see them quite easily and so you can see here an example of um, a, a sort of a layer, a solution, solution surface basically. In 3D these will be surfaces uh, that are essentially represented by micro folds. Uh, but these folds are not related with the deformation. They are really an effect of differential pressure solution that takes place uh, and accumulation of organic matter. So that's suggestive of a carbonate and because of that it should uh, fizz uh, vividly. Uh, many times this is happening in carbonates and in fact you, you can hear the, the heavy fizzing. And so this, uh, this is, you know, micritic uh, material that is dominated by, by calcite and also carbon. There is abundance of carbon here because as I was explaining earlier, when you dissolve the calcite and you reprecipitate the calcite in other locations, you tend to accumulate the organic matter. Um, so that's more of a micritic, uh, micritic limestone, so a carbonate. Um, this one is rather looking like a flint to me. And I have sort of a combination of, of clay material here and definitely quartz. Uh, so you can see it's very edgy. So the, the amount of silica is real, really here almost 100%. Uh, so a combination of certainly some organic matter, but yeah, lots of silica. And, and so this is really cherty, cherty material and uh, I can see some stratification but it's fairly irregular uh, which is suggestive of uh, um, the formation of a concretion so quite often in limestone you will tend to form nodules uh, and these these nodules uh, are you know elliptical nodules uh, that form by accretion basically so you start with, with a very tiny nodule of silica and then progressively grow uh, several layers of silica around that nodule. So these are processes related with diagenesis that tend to reprecipitate the silica that is contained uh, in a rock. And so you dissolve the silica and move it in another location and form these uh, nodular features uh, which are commonly called flints. And so when you break them, they look like this and they have this uh, sort of strata which indicate uh, that there has been a significant amount of accretion. Um, there are clays in them, cavities, which also recom sort of support the hypothesis that the rock form uh, through uh, accretion and alteration of the silica uh, will tend to produce uh, um, clays. Uh, um, so we have some clays here, they are quite dull, so this is likely kaolinite uh, because it's really white in color and it does have um, uh, low strength, so it's very, very soft. I can scratch it definitely with, with uh, the steel knife. Uh, 
So I hope this was informative. We have the here the call. So I think that's the um, anthracite var variety of coal. Um, so again, this is a very s smooth rock. Uh, this is composition will be dominated by carbon, you know. So that's organic matter that has been turned into pure carbon. Uh, and so sometimes it will be graphitic uh, as well. And uh, um, yeah, you can still recognize some of the stratification of this coal measure. And that's uh, again um, a good indication that this is a sedimentary rock for sure. Uh, so the strata, uh, the crystallinity of the coal will help you. So the, the more the coal shines, uh, and this is quite reflective, the more you are dealing with uh, a matured coal, uh, which is usually have, have higher calorific power. And so this is why, uh, you know, the, uh, the coke or the anthracite will be better if compared to lignites. Uh, lignites will tend to be more opaque in color, so they don't shine as much. And, um, and because of that, also, also they have less calorific power. But the, yeah, the coal is easy to recognize also because of this density. It does have a very low density. And so it's very light, uh, the feeling. So it's a bit like pumice. Uh, and uh, I don't think you will have problems identifying coal really because of the color. And uh, again, reflectivity will help you with uh, the differentiation between lignites and, and uh, um, the uh, anthracites. Okay, we complete, I think, this lab by um, giving some names uh, to these rocks. Uh, and so we start from the beginning again, and uh, we will have essentially rocks that have grains uh, that are gravelly, so dominated by gravels. Uh, so if you remember, rocks that contain more than 30% gravel will be in that world of conglomerates and breccias. So definitely these four specimens here uh, can be classified respect respectively as a conglomerate. Here we have a rudite. This is likely a diamictite. Um, so how, how am I naming this rock? You have to look at the diagram that looks at the percentages of uh, clasts versus matrix. So as soon, as soon as I see a matrix supported aggregate, I would uh, uh, be more inclined to call this rock a diamictite. Uh, if the class are touching themselves, uh, they are both angular and rounded. Uh, I'm more on a rudite, so it's a mixture, really. And if everything is angular and uh, you have a really large class here, same composition, uh, this is, for me, a carbonate breccia quite often. And so that's, that's a breccia because all the class are angular, right? Um, so a breccia that was likely formed in, in a karst system, and then you get silicification that takes, replace mo most of the rock. And these, uh, if they fizz, uh, they will be carcarenites. Uh, they are quite gritty, so you have to use uh, the, the touch or ask uh, if uh, the, the rock feels gritty in, in your oral examination and sort of check the uh, fossiliferous content. So this could be a fossiliferous limestone or a calcarenite, depending on the amount of mud that is uh, included. If you use the classification that is provided, uh, uh, which looks at the percentage of carbonates uh, versus um, quartz and clays, uh, you will have uh, um, a distinction. We're talking about, uh, I think, the nomenclature of some of these specimens. Uh, and we were on these ones that are fossiliferous. Uh, and so if they fizz, uh, you can call them fossiliferous limestone or uh, um, Again, 
we have the business of, of discussing the composition and, and, and understanding the proportions of carbonates versus clays. So a rock that is a mixture of uh, clays uh, and uh, uh, limestone, usually it's a marl stone. So check the lab on sedimentary rocks and you will find a classification that helps you with, the, with that distinction. Um, so you will have to use the acid and based on the amount of fees you can sort of guess the proportion of, of clays. Uh, another way of calling it marlstone is usually calcarenite, which will give you also an indication of uh, not only the composition, but also the grain size. Uh, and since this rock is quite gritty, it's uh, an arenite. Uh, and then you have these other specimens, which you can call them, you know, a uh, fossiliferous sandstone, so remember, sand is the loose sediment, but sandstone stands for lithified, so a consolidated sediment will be uh, a sandstone if uh, you know, the grains uh, are uh, above, above the uh, 10 to the 2 of 64, so 0064 millimeters. Uh, and uh, yes, between that and two, usually it's a sandstone. Everything that's, that's below will be a sealstone or uh, a shale or a claystone. Um, so rocks that have a very fine, fine uh, material composing them. Okay, so for this sandstone, really uh, you can, you know, call it a fossiliferous sandstone because of the organic content and you can then tell me the story about the different uh, materials that are contained uh, in this uh, specimen and the composition. Uh, there is no fees, if I remember correctly in this rock, uh, so go back to the video if, to check, but this doesn't fees, I think, and so it would be mostly siliciclastic material and clays, um, so you have silica and clays that dominate uh, um, so that's quite easy. Um, this one, it's a really a quartz rich sandstone. So since we're not dealing with metamorphism, you can think of this as a sandstone because it's quite gritty. I can still feel with my fingers the grittiness uh, uh, quite heavily. So I think uh, this is a sandstone or at least the protolite is a sandstone and it's a quartz rich sandstone so if you look at the classifications for the sandstone we have a classification that is a compo combination of composition and uh, uh, the grain size so sandstone is referring to the grain size and quartz is a prefix that indicates the abundance of quartz uh, this one, you know, could be a, a rock that is halfway through between uh, the arcosic component uh, and uh, this one that is more uh, still a quartz, quartz rich sandstone, I would say. Uh, and you could call it a quartz and, and muscovite rich sandstone, for example. Um, but this rock really is closer to this in terms of composition, so it's dominated by siliciclastic, but also has some phyllosilicates. And this is the example of an, an arcose or a feldspatic, a feldspatic sandstone. So those would be the two uh, classification terms in, in terms of name that I would accept uh, because uh, they imply essentially the heavy abundance of feldspar. So an immature sandstone, an arcose, or a feldspatic sandstone, or a quartz of feldspatic, quartz feldspatic sandstone, I think would be better because, you know, we have quite a bit of quartz, so you can recognize crystals of quartz quite easily. Okay, so quartz of feldspatic sand, sandstone there,
And then we move into the world of the siltstones. Uh, so this would be a siltstone because I can still feel the grains, uh, but uh, yeah, it's quite smooth. So it's, you know, between a shale and uh, uh, a sandstone. So a siltstone, it's, it's I think a good classification for these. Uh, and you would have, you know, uh, term this rock as siliciclastic uh, because of the fact that it doesn't really fizz. So these are your siltstones, uh, which have a variable component uh, of clays and uh, quartz. That's a chert. Uh, uh, again, it could be classified as a shale that has been oxi oxidized and uh, silicified and then replaced by, by magnetite. Uh, and this is an evaporite. Uh, so I would definitely call it an, an evaporitic rock. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, describe again the composition. So the variation in carbonates and, and, and gypsum. Uh, so these are mudstones as well. You can call them mudstone um, because of the high level of mud in the rock. So a mudstone, usually mudstone is a generic term. It will include both silts, silt and shale material. So when you are between a shale and uh, a silt, you can call it a mudstone. But this is quite quite stratified so I would still call this a shale uh, potentially but yeah with uh, a, a good amount of clays and not much silicification and this instead is really the typical shale it will have you know lots of silica in it really highly silicified rock uh, and very dark uh, and very stratified uh, and so those are your shales uh, very smooth uh, Grain size really is a key distinguishing factor. And you're left with the coal. And this is, you know, chert again. And micrites or limestone. So this is a limestone because of the exclusive sort of amount of, of carbonate. Uh, so dominated by carbonate uh, and microcrystalline rock. So that's why you call it a micrite as well because it's referring to the size. Um, so if you want to combine grain size and uh, composition, you could call this rock a micritic limestone. And I think this is uh, concluding this sedimentary lab really, which had the intent of giving you this panoramic of the different uh, sedimentary rocks uh, that we are considering in this uh, uh, geology for engineering course. Uh, in the next lab, which is the last one, we will be going into the discussion of rocks that are more metamorphic, so me metamorphic rocks, but we will see that we have different grades of metamorphism. And so we will see much more complicated metamorphic rocks uh, in which you will be unable to recognize the precursor rock really. And so that will be dedicated to rocks that have witnessed variable degrees of change in terms of pressure and, and temperature, which again changes the stability of the mineralogy in the rock. So looking forward to that lab and uh, Yes, this lab is completed. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, contact me via email and I'll be happy to, to answer any, any uh, request.